the big challenges here is that uh, you're trying to explain to the students that working with, I don't know, Ukrainians or Germans is different than working with, I don't know, Americans. And they look at you and they, it's not that they don't believe you, it's they don't fully understand what you're trying to say. It's as if you're trying to teach them how to swim on the football field. So you really have to get into that water to understand you know, what water is. Same thing with international business. And so at some point, I had an idea about eight years ago that maybe we can add almost like a lab or practical additional exercise to the course where students <coughs> would experience in real life uh, what I'm trying to explain to them in the classroom. And so attempts of something like that have been, had been done before, so we've had a number of projects over the years where students from different countries would work with one another in international teams and in the process presumably experience those international challenges of international collaboration. But the problem with those projects, and we had a few in the 90s and 2000s, the problem with those projects uh, was that one, they were costly, so there was really no technology to connect the students and so they had to develop proprietary platforms, they had to give big grants. In all of the cases that I'm familiar with, once the grants uh, expired, the project shut down. And so because of all those difficulties, they were also relatively small. Like there was one project where students from Canada, Mexico, and the United States worked together. There was another one, uh, students from uh, the United States and Israel worked together. But as I said, they lasted for a few years, did pretty well, but then once the money dried up, they just vanished. So in my case, it must have been the right time uh, because when we, let me see which one switches the slides. Um, yeah. So when we started, uh, we had all the technology from Facebook to Dropbox to Google Docs, and I think that helped us a lot. And so I'll talk about that in a minute, about the logistics. But before we get, I want to talk a little bit about the you know, human civilization. So when you look at humans, can you tell me what or who or which developments had the huge, the biggest impact on our civilization? And if I define, I don't know, impact, I guess, impact at the quality of our life, the number of people on this planet, so basically us humans. Can you give me some ideas? What had the biggest impact or who or, I don't know, developer? What was that? about sometimes I hear wars or religions or epidemics, all kinds of things. But when you look at the number of humans on planet Earth, there were a few distinct, uh, there have been a few distinct um, kind of inflection points when our life had changed dramatically. So we've been here for about 200,000 years. And during all this time, apparently there were only a few million of us. And then agriculture and all that so made a huge difference. And so the biggest invention of that time was Basically, we learned how to use animals to um, extend our abilities. So up until the agricultural revolution and domestication of animals, we could only rely on this, right? And then all of a sudden, we have horses and cows, and all of a sudden, we have kind of more, a little bit more strength. And then this happened, the Industrial Revolution. So the machine allowed us to go even further beyond the limits of our muscle power. And so we could move things fast and far and, you know, big, big things. And then the next revolution was the computational revolution, the computing revolution. So if the machines allowed us to go beyond the limits of our muscle power or the muscle power of our animals, the computer revolution allowed us to go beyond the limits of our brain cognitive abilities. So all of a sudden we can do millions of computations per second. And then recently we experienced this. Oh, Gangnam The reason I put that song there the significance is the first product that reached an audience of a billion people, and it took it, by the way, like half a year. So apparently Despacito is the next one, now it has like five billion views or something like that, I didn't check the latest statistics. But the point here is that after the computing revolution, the social revolution came, and all of a sudden we can connect to just about anyone on this planet with virtually zero cost. I mean, from your phone you can communicate to just about anyone on this planet. And so all of a sudden we can then work as a super organism, you know, completely interconnected. And that presents a lot of uh, opportunities, but also some challenges. So, yeah. so when you look at the opportunities, so again, all those 200,000 years or so, we mainly worked in relatively small groups. So the tribes were up to people, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. 
Then as civilization started emerging, so we had some projects that would involve up to 10,000 people uh, you know, in army. Egyptian pyramids, they say, took about uh, 100,000 people working at the same time on the project. Uh, NASA's moon landing took about half a million people working together. Um, anyone knows what's the biggest collaborative project in human history that involved the largest number of people working together? Anyone? Actually, you could have been part of the project without even knowing it. Does this look familiar to you from like 10 years ago? So that was collaboration between Capture and Google. So Google was trying to digitalize all the books they could find. And they literally had many people who were standing and scanning books. But then they would run that text with images for the text recognition software. And sometimes the text recognition software would not recognize some words. And so what they did is uh, Capture every time you log into your bank account, it would give you two words. One is the real test if you're a machine or a human, and the other one is the word that Google's algorithm could not recognize. And so by typing that word, you essentially helped Google to convert those books to text. And so they say up to a billion people participated in that project, even though, again, in most cases, we didn't even know. And so uh, for a few years, I was part of this. Um, but the problem here is that while we have this wonderful connectivity, in many cases, this is what we sort of use it for. Right, so that's a waste. And so now we finally see <laughs> now we finally see um, applications that actually do improve our productivity and uh, creativity and all kinds of things. So anyway, the way or the time when I envisioned or started my project, X Culture, it was right at the time when all of this technology was available, but not quite quite used, you know, for good purposes. And so it all started with a very simple email, like literally one evening uh, from this very campus. I sent an email to the Academy of Management uh, members asking if anyone wants to participate in a project where students uh, from my class and students from their class will be put in international teams and will complete some sort of a project uh, in those international teams. And I thought it would be one, maybe two more professors, uh, but surprisingly, literally within a few hours, we got dozens and dozens of responses. And so before we knew it, uh, uh, we literally doubled in size every year. And so for example, this semester we have almost uh, 6,000 students, 150, 160 universities, of course also a little bit more, the numbers are a little outdated, 40 countries, all six continents. And so what we do with those students is uh, we put them in global virtual teams, uh, where each team is comprised of about six students and each one of them would be in a different country. And so this way they have to deal with their time zone differences, cultural differences, language proficiency differences, institutional differences, and so they would be working on projects. When we did it in the beginning, uh, the first couple of years, we would give them a hypothetical case study, but then one of our professors was doing some consulting. Uh, I think it was Mercedes Benz at that time. Uh, they were trying to come up with creative uh, marketing ideas uh, for their buses and trucks, I think, for Africa. And then, uh, so they thought, well, maybe it would be a good idea to ask students uh, what they think about it. And so they contacted me, and I thought, yeah, that would be an interesting exercise for the students. So uh, we had at that time, I can't remember, must have been about 3,000 students, and they provided lots of interesting ideas. Um, Mercedes liked it so much that they even invited members of some of the best teams to visit their factory in Turkey, where they have a full cycle factory, like a gigantic factory that makes buses and trucks. So ever since, we would then work with uh, up to 15 companies in a given semester. Like this semester, we have 15 companies, and they would ask all kinds of questions. Like uh, Home Depot was asking how do they expand beyond North America, and how they improve um, their dot-com services uh, for the clients. Uh, Louis Vuitton had a question where they should open the next store, and how to design it to make it most appealing to their local customers there. Um, so all kinds of questions of that kind, mainly related to international business. And uh, so here are some of them, uh, clients that we worked in with uh, uh, recently, uh, so you may recognize also uh, uh, Polaris, that's the guys who make snowmobiles. We actually try to work more with smaller companies uh, that tend to be um, sort of more appreciative of the ideas that the students come up with, and in many cases put them, implement them even before the semester is over, so when the good ideas come along. And so this way students gain two things. On the one hand, they gain international experience, working with people from other cultures, but on the other hand, they get experience in sort of business consulting. But now technology. So when we started this project, everybody was saying that you need to develop a platform where students would log in and communicate and professors would monitor their performance. And probably that's what we would have you know, had to do 15 years ago. 
But all of a sudden, we have all of these tools that everybody uses, and they're free, and they're wonderful. And in fact, every semester, new things come along. So uh, Slack, Trello, uh, I don't have them on the picture here, obviously, you know, Dropbox, Google Docs, all of those. And so all of a sudden, this project essentially is, I don't want to call it free, because it takes a huge amount of time and a lot of volunteer hours from the hundreds of professors and many graduate assistants. But in a sense, technologically, we don't really use anything. So most teams literally create Google Facebook group. And they share documents there, they communicate there, they have phone calls there. So uh, some that are more sophisticated would have, as I said, a Slack or Trello account. And they have enough free options that students can use it for free. The beauty of this also is that it's not only for free, in, in a sense, but also uh, after the project is over, the students keep using those tools. Um, again, I've communicated to many professors who had done it before using proprietary platforms. In their case, students not only have to learn how their platform works, but once the project is over, that's it. So here, many students use email, Facebook, Dropbox, all those things for, for the first time. And in many cases, they like it and they keep using it. I will be talking a little bit later about one of the offshoots of this project, which is Exculture Kids. So this semester we have about a thousand kids from 56 countries that are also participating in this project, ages 9 to 17. And so my own kids participated in this project last semester when we were testing it. And so I thought it would be all about you know, cultural enrichment, and I thought it would be all about learning about you know, how to work with people from other countries. But it turned out for my kids the most educational part was to learn how to write emails. You know, like literally, they didn't know. First of all, it didn't, didn't even occur to me that my kids didn't have email accounts. And second, when they started communicating with the team, you know, they would literally like write two words and one smiley face. And like, no, no, you're a business consultant now. You have to write like full sentences. You have to explain things, even if it's you know Facebook group or even if it's Skype or Viber or one of those things. So um, it's free technology, but you know, students have to learn. Anyway. Um, at the end, we give students um, uh, recommendation letters and certificates, and we get literally hundreds of emails um, in a given semester from students who say, hey, professor, I participated in your project three semesters ago or one year ago, and then I was interviewing for a job, and there were 100 other applicants, and everybody was alike, but then my um, employer or interviewer was falling asleep, and I remembered about its culture. I said, hey, I did this project with people from like seven different countries. So he wakes up and says, oh, tell me more. And before I know it, I got the job. So not everyone has this experience. Um, obviously, it's sometimes overwhelming. Uh, some students complain about some students disappearing for a few days, uh, like it's a national holiday somewhere in Pakistan, and you know, all of a sudden the team member is not responding. Uh, all kinds of uh, institutional differences, you know, expectations from professors, plagiarism. But that's the whole point. Those differences, experiencing those differences is exactly what we want them to do. In fact, the best movie of all time, uh, Back to the Future, is arguably the best movie of all time. <laughs> so I couldn't build a time machine, but this project kind of gives you a time, uh, I guess, future, a preview of the future. So all the challenges students experience here, you know, somebody is too bossy, somebody is disrespectful, somebody is not listening to you because you're a female and in his culture it's not, you know, something or maybe somebody is, as I said, you know, less responsible or less proficient in English or whatever. All those things will probably happen when they do it as part of their job. And uh, so here we sort of give them that preview when the cost of the mistake is very small. So um, does it work? Uh, we have conducted a bunch of studies. In fact, we collect a lot of data. Uh, those of you who might be interested in research, we have immense amounts of data. Um, about 2,000 variables, multi-level, multi-source, uh, longitudinal, and so we're trying to study all kinds of things, uh, mainly why some teams do better than others, why some people are more likely to be team leaders, uh, why some people get better peer evaluations. But we also looked at, for example, um, uh, effectiveness of this project itself, and so we looked at uh, student reactions, students love it. In fact, sometimes almost counterintuitively, like for example, we had a bunch of controlled experiments where professors would teach two cor uh, same course, multiple sections of the same course, and one section would have Exculture and the other one doesn't. And then we would look at the course evaluations. And so when you add Exculture instead of a controlled kind of domestic project, students give you better peer evaluations on every dimension consistently. We've done it many times, including, for example, how well was this course organized? And we know when Exculture is part of the course, it's not better organized. It's much more chaotic. It's much more you know demanding. 
And even then, students say, yeah, I think it was a better course. It seems like they really like it. Uh, cultural intelligence improves from before to after compared to the control groups. On the exams, when you have a project, I mean, a section with and without exculture, students with exculture do better on the test, and we don't know really why, because, I mean, they attend the same lectures, they read the same textbook, and the exam is about ideas, not about the project. Maybe it's a matter of motivation. We also have many students every semester, not many, but about a dozen students every semester who participate in the project the second time. So some of them will participate the first time as undergraduate students, then move on to MBA somewhere else, and it happens to be that this project is part of an MBA course, so they have to do it again. And so when they participate the second time, they're much more likely to be team leaders, they get higher peer evaluations, their teams write better reports, so it tells us that probably they learned something the first time that allowed them to be better the second time. And then obviously, as I said, they're much more likely to get job offers, uh, internship offers as a result of this experience. Um, now, some of the things started happening that we didn't plan initially on. Like, for example, we go to um, the Academy of International Business Conference um, every semester, I mean, every year. And so we started bringing some of the students, but then the demand was so huge that we started bringing too many students to the conference. And they said, well, you know, it's almost becoming a student conference, so maybe we want to reconsider that. And so now we organize a separate sculpture symposium twice a year, and so just have one in Italy, and we'll have another one in two months in Canada. And so we usually bring about 150 students, so we had a bunch of them in some of the locations here, but here are some of the pictures that we took with the students. When students, exculture students, when they take a picture, they try to make some sort of a cross, like X. And so that's one of the biggest we've had. But uh, so uh, here are some of the examples, you know. So going to a company trip somewhere, so some of the, so that's with the Home Depot a few years ago. Now, other offshoot or unexpected sort of things um, um, are, and I'll leave them in a second, I'll just say that with exculture, it's kind of, almost a good thing, I guess. Uh, many people think that we had some um, you know, genius behind it or some uh, strategic planning session where we came up with a brilliant you know, design and, uh, and you know, implemented it. In reality, it all is demand driven. So all of those things happen because uh, the clients, the students demand it. Like for example, the coaching program. So many students come and say, can I do it again? And so it kind of, you know, sometimes they have to do it because it's part of the second course that they take or it's part of the course. But then we thought, well, if they want to participate so much again, why not maybe offer them something better? And so a few years ago, we created this coaching program where we trained them for a few more weeks, uh, so the best students from the last semester. And then they have to take some tests. And so this way they gain managerial experience. So they train the new generation of exculture students. And for me, I get basically 50 people who help me for free. And so literally many of them work pretty much full time. So all those you know, difficult situations, uh, feedback, uh, all kinds of things. So everybody wins. Uh, I mentioned the kids version. So again, same thing, professors kept coming to me saying, I have a kid 12 years old, very smart. I mean, can he please participate in your project? I'm like, well, it's mainly MBA students, some university students, the difference in age is just too big. But then we thought, well, if the demand is so high, maybe let's try to have a few teams. So we tried the first time, I think we had like three teams or four teams, then about 20 teams, and then we decided why not announce it publicly, and we did it. We got like 2,000 applications, selected about 1,000 kids, as I said, 56 countries in the final sample, and so it's going very well. So we have some schools that participate. We have mainly parents who actually enroll their kids on, on their, you know, all. Uh, a big kind of, <coughs> the biggest demand comes from homeschooled kids who are geniuses and who study at home, but the parents feel, you know, they can cover the math and, you know, physics and all those other courses, but the kids don't have the social contact. So they really love us because we give them an opportunity to kind of hang out with other kids. And some of those kids, I mean, they're like true geeks. I mean, when they come to the webinars, and we had a few of them at the symposium in Italy, I mean, like, they literally can, can put to shape some of my MBA students. I mean, like, you know, 15 years old and definitely, you know, like Harvard material. Hackathon is another thing that we've experimented for a couple of years now. Um, so as I said, we collect a lot of data, and we make those data available to anyone for free. And so a lot of research going on around this project. We have, uh, I don't even know how many publications, half a dozen dissertations defended, another dozen or so for development. But then we started experimenting with um, kind of research marathons, where about a dozen professors come to a campus. We actually did one here at UNCG, one in Wisconsin. We will do another one in Calgary in July. 
And so we literally lock ourselves up in a dormitory. And so the whole idea is that it's like very, very low cost, very simple. So we stay in the dormitory with, at a local cafeteria. And for like a week, we do nothing but research. Like wake up, do research, bread for lunch, do more research until you drop and sleep, wake up and keep doing that. And so normally it takes you about a year to write a paper. But in reality, it's only about 100 hours. It's just because you know we work for a few hours today, then another few hours maybe next week. And so it takes a whole year. Here, nonstop for a week, you can print out a paper. So it's not a fully polished paper, but you go home with a paper with you know with context, with an interesting idea. So uh, we do those now three, four times a year at different schools. Uh, virtual PA is another sort of outcome of this project. Um, hundreds of students say uh, or send me emails and say, "Hey, professor, I love the project. I will be applying to graduate school sometime soon. Uh, can I work for you as your TA for free? I don't need any money. I just need maybe a reference letter." some point, I'm willing to help you whatever help you need. So for me it's experience and mentorship and you get free help. And then we thought, well, why not create a platform where students can sort of, you know, almost like uh, Uber or, or Airbnb just for, for teaching assistance. And so we now have a pilot version, so where we have a couple hundred students in the, you know, in the system, I'm mainly working with exculture professors. But if everything goes well, it may become relatively big and maybe there will be even a day when students apply to graduate programs, they will say, and according to my virtual TA profile, I, I don't know, I've done 1,000 hours of teaching assistant work for professors. My average rating is 4.9 and things like that. So maybe that will even play a role. So things like that. Um, I talked about the coaching program and the kids. And I guess, yeah, that's, that's briefly what we do. As I said, I would like to reemphasize one more time the beauty of all of this is that um, we use tools that are only free and publicly available, and the good thing is that it's enough. So today you don't need to, to use anything else. And second, as I said, the, the model is set up in a way um, that it's more of a network rather than a business. And while we do need resources, and it would be nice to have a large grant so we can hire some permanent help, but at the same time, the way it's set up is we just rely, I mean, rely on, on the many students and professors who are willing to help for free. And it makes coordination a little harder, but at the same time, we operate virtually with no budget. We're actually trying to write now the um, textbook specifically for global virtual team management. And so with the plan to be used as part of this culture kind of literature that students need to read. And luckily the library is actually providing some help us, uh, you know, so we can hire copy editors and things like that. But that's the only times when we actually need like real work. Just about everything else we can do with volunteer help. And I guess that makes us not really indestructible, but we do not depend on a big budget, and so once the grant expires, we will go out of business. I guess we are relatively, uh, what's the word, viable in that respect, so uh, vital. So. All right, thank you so much.
software that I co-created with Nicholas Van Horn at Capital University. And um, essentially what Mastermind does is fills in this uh, niche in social, social network research and digital network research. There's a lot of free tools, as was previously, previously mentioned, which gives good context for my talk here following up. And uh, what I want to talk about are some of the limitations of the free tools, especially for academic research. Um, and what Mastermind does is essentially provides um, data collection and data processing services for folks who don't have the time or the ability to really build that skill set out. So currently what Mastermind does is it just collects and processes the data and provides a clean uh, data set that's ready to go in JSON or CSV formats so that researchers can import this into the analytics software of their choice and get going with the analysis part. As we know, in big data and data analytics, most of our time is spent data wrangling and getting things ready for analysis before we even can start analyzing them and, and framing our research questions and coming at them in those sorts of ways. So currently, Mastermind has Twitter, Wikipedia, Tumblr, Google Trends, and general web scrapes. And our most recent addition is the uh, Raspberry Pi update, which we added in 2018. So a lot of us have these sitting around. We bought them for makerspaces and hackathons, but a lot of people don't know what to do with them besides printing a case for them with a 3D printer. So we hope to fill in that gap and start using these for research and other things. So this allows us to extend into Internet of Things research and thinking about you know, wearable devices and remote data collection. And you know, thinking about this talk, if you go back Go back to my title, uh, developing a cultural macroscope. You know, the difference between a cultural macroscope and what we might say a camera panopticon is a very narrow line. And, and usually in a, ver in a ver version of this talk, I, I, I discuss the surveillance economy and privacy rights quite a bit. Um, most of us are catching up on that. Um, if there's an upside to some recent political events, it would be that we're becoming more and more aware of these networks as surveillance tools, right? And as, you know, how, while we get a lot of power for, say, business analytics, we get a lot of downside in the cost of our own privacy. So today's talk is not so much about that because we're catching up on that, I think, quite a bit. I want to talk about the downside of the free business model. While there's a lot of upsides in terms of cost, there's a lot of downsides as well. And also, I would like to say, uh, we're recently partnering with uh, Educopia and the UNCG Library with our next round of funding. So we're hoping to add a bunch of new sources. So we're adding uh, YouTube uh, comments, we're adding Reddit, data.gov, and a, a Happy Trust, and a few others, because our main goal is to fill in, again, this gap where a lot of scholars don't have time to learn all the skills they need to clean and process data and want to get to the analysis aspect. So. Okay, so essentially, um, you would think in the, in the time that it's taken, over the last five years, where we've built out MassMind and we filled out our, our, sort of our tutorials, our documentation, have really done a lot of work to facilitate helping folks collect data and do research, you would think that the industry has caught up, meaning you would think that there'd be a lot more tools available for academic research or for folks who want to ask questions beyond product development, business development, marketing, these sort of traditional questions that are supported in social networks, you would think there'd be a lot more support for that. When in fact there's not. Since we started in 2015, the accessibility, the accessibility of social network data has drastically reduced. And a big cause of that problem is mer mergers and acquisitions in the big data industry. So for example, an article from 2015 called The Politics of Trending, where Yu Song Kim simply just did a, a, a very basic analysis to ask, what is a social network? trend. When we're told these things are trending in social networks. How is that working? Who gets to decide? What are the tools that are telling us these are the most important or, or the cultural elements that are getting the most attention? How is that functioning and why? And, and so she just simply used a simple free cloud tool called Topsy, which let her compare the basic activity going on in Twitter to what Twitter said was trending. So for example, in one of her comparisons, she compares um, something that was said to be trending by Twitter, which was explain a movie by its title to early versions of Black Lives Matter, like the Ferguson trend and others that really became sort of the basis of what is now Black Lives Matter. And what she showed was, very simply, if you look at the attention um, 
a lot of this is the downside of how we determine what a trend is algorithmically. So we know that trends are often very sensitive to new things. They do this for a reason. Justin Bieber would trend every day, right? Or the biggest new pop star would always trend. So one of the ways in which algorithms try to find out what is trending is by looking for a big spike or a new spike. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but you can see where the differential between almost no activity and what was just a couple thousand tweets triggered a trend algorithmically, whereas a huge amount of um, activity that was going on with Fergus's question for two reasons. One, the networks got smart. Twitter's terms of service no longer allows you to benchmark them or measure them. This is a problem. If, if Twitter now is one of the premier networks for news, for circulating content, for circulating the results of science even, and they, we do not have the ability to question how they bring attention to things, we really have a fundamental problem in how we're circulating knowledge and information on our planet. And so Topsy no longer exists. Apple bought them in 2015 for 200 million and shut them down later that year so that they could use that data to power their own search service on all our phones. That little swipe search that you use on Apple that's in your phone, Topsy's data, which was every tweet ever collected, powered that search. It gave them the knowledge they needed to, to basically build out their search engine to compete with Google and other search services. And I love what is still available on Topsy's Twitter account, a bit of sarcasm, because the CEO was really angry once they got closed down. Every tweet ever published previously at your fingertips. Right? This is a real problem. This is a real problem. It's funny, yes, yes, I, I share that too. But it, it's really disturbing to me that for all the commercials on the advancement of AI and business analytics, the advancement and the power of these tools to do research, Academics and scholars can't get involved unless we want to use the tools to do marketing and brand management research, right? Sorry, you can tell I'm passionate about this. So, you would think that um, this would be an isolated event, but it is not. Uh, just this year, um, partially came the Cambridge Analytica scandal really sped up a lot of this loss of access. Um, while the Cambridge Analytica scandal, again, was fantastic for bringing privacy and surveillance to the forefront of the political conversation globally, I'm very grateful for that. To, you know, it's sad the cost that it took to get us there, but I'm grateful for that. The downside is that it sped up even more of these mergers and acquisitions to hide some of these business models. So Facebook quickly, Facebook's top uh, data partner, DataSift, which they used for a lot of their anonymization. They used it, uh, it was the infrastructure for their trend soft, for their trend analytics. That was recently spun off and sold. Twitter just collapsed Ganip into themselves, which means they, they purchased Ganip, I believe, in 2016, but now there is no sort of separate data source. Twitter now is the full authority on all the data that flows in their networks. Again, this is really concerning because at least with the third-party data vendors, while that wasn't a great model, and while the, the free model that facilitated wasn't great, at least you had someone out there fact-checking and sort of challenging some of these things. As these companies grow and their own data becomes a revenue source, they're now siloing it all internally so that it really puts us in a hard spot to even question the value of their data. And uh, I'd like to uh, show this quote from Sumall. So Sumall is, is one of the newer free tools. It's great um, for business analytics and marketing if you're an influencer of sorts, right? You, these are all things that, that have value. There's nothing wrong with using these for business analytics, and I don't mean to make that the whipping boy of the conversation or make it the downside of all this. There's Certainly there's value and uses to these things. And that as people are starting to point out, there's even ways to do it in which we don't have to completely surveil people at the levels we currently are. But the downside of the free model is that if we build up practices of research outside of, say, business analytics, and we are reliant on these cloud tools, essentially what we're doing is helping them build share value for when they sell or go public, and then that infrastructure goes away. So basically, we're giving them free testers. We're, we're finding ways to facilitate this research academically. I've seen people screenshot things from cloud tools um, and, and really, the downside of that is not only that these can be sold, but they also can't be peer-reviewed. 
So for example, if you want to go to some all and ask them, how did you process your data? How did you produce these results? They're going to say, well, I'm sorry, that's proprietary methods. Just trust our results. Now again, if you're in the business world, there's a certain you know, notion that you're hoping that what you're buying, you're getting, that's fine. But in, in academic peer-reviewed research, if we don't know how the data is processed, if we can't get access to the raw data to question, to question those processing methods, then how can we ever peer review any of those results? We can't. These tools just can't be used for academic research. And so, I want to close with um, talking about really what's motivating us going forward. Um, as we're sort of building out MassMind and thinking about all the ways in which we can facilitate the research of digital networks and social networks and what their future might look like. Part of what we might have to do is find ways to get involved in the networks themselves and how they're built. This was just last month, and I want to end with this because I'm still not sure what to do with it. But just last month, Jack Dorsey basically admitted that they don't even know how to manage the data in their own network. So I'm going to play this quote and then unpack it a little bit and leave you with this. Oh, to give a little context, this is a debate about Alex Jones getting banned from Twitter. Twitter was one of the last networks to do it, and so this is talking about content moderation and ethics, but it really sort of provides context for the research future of these networks and what the value of that data might be. You have heard it right at the end, but Jack Dorsey said it doesn't scale. This is, a, this is a really shocking revelation. And just, just two weeks ago, Facebook said we would now welcome government regulation for helping us moderate the information flowing in these networks. This is, this, you know, what these networks are doing to global communication and their influence on it and how knowledge spreads, we're still figuring out. We're still one, two, three years behind what they already have known and tested in these networks. And what I would really challenge folks on is I'm not sure how valuable some of this data is for research post-algorithmic filtering. Meaning, since 2009 on Facebook and since 2015 in Twitter and Instagram, I think what the data really tells us is just how effective their algorithms have been in steering us toward advertising. And so, um, really when you're studying these networks, from that point forward, obviously there's ways in which to, to collect data on niche conversations, to collect data on groups in ways that can be very effective. But if you're looking at these networks as a whole, and you're thinking about their role in global communication, I'm not so sure that these data sets are valuable going forward. Because essentially in the rest of this interview, Jack Dorsey admits that basically they've kind of ruined their data, and now they're trying to sort of clean it up as they go. But their whole business model is based on, the whole way they provide their networks for free is on an advertising model. And that advertising model is based on organic experiences where algorithmic filtering presents, presents content to you in such a manner that then the advertisements appear to flow organically within that. Right? Here's a post on topic X. Here's something closely related you may want to buy. Click on it. The problem is, is that steered information so much that those network effects are now what give us the uh, shocking echo chamber environments that we're now witnessing. I don't know what to do with this going forward, but I do know that if academics can't get involved in measuring and looking at and studying these networks, if only corporations who can afford the fire hose can get access to this data, I'm not sure we can solve these problems at scale. If we're gonna really think about content moderation at scale, then one of the first steps is opening up these networks in such a way that more of us who aren't just interested in profit can just ask, what is it doing to the way we communicate? So, thank you.
guys were looking a little post-lunch from up here, at least. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about this uh, group I helped direct called The Maintainers, which is a global interdisciplinary research network focused on, focused on maintenance, repair, and mundane work with things. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you what we've been up to and especially uh, how this relates to libraries, digital preservation, scholarly communications, and the like. Um, I want to tell you with how this all started, which is kind of sad. Um, it started from basically a place of frustration, maybe even anger. A lot of my projects start that way. I've been talking <laughs> to my therapist about it a little bit. Um, and what in particular I was frustrated with was I was in higher education, and there was this word that was getting thrown around a lot, innovation. You guys might have heard this before. It was innovation, innovation, disruptive innovation, innovation, innovation. I was at a university, uh, Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, that had unwisely trademarked the motto, the, the Innovation University, which was not true. Um, and so what I started doing is, um, for a while, I went around and gave a talk where I would pretend to be in a 12-step alcohol synonymous style group. I would stand up and say, hi, my name is Lee. I'm an innovation speaker in recovery. My innovation speak of choice was neo shelterian economics, whatever. It would go on from there. It, went, it didn't go over very well at innovation conferences, obviously. It went out over well with like Marxist critical theorists, go figure. Uh, and then in 2015, my life changed when this book came out. It's called The Innovators, How a Group of Hackers, Geniuses, and Geeks Created the Digital Revolution by Walter Isaacson. And my buddy Andy Russell was in the shower. He came up with a joke. And he said, we should write a counter volume called The Maintainers, How a Group of Bureaucrats, Standards Engineers, and Introverts Create Technologies that Kind of Work Most of the Time. <laughs> That's Andy. He's a dean now. That's another sad story. We don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so then yeah, we did two things. We, have, we wrote an essay called Hail the Maintainers on Eon, and we held our first conference uh, in 2016 at Stevens, and then something, it, it was basically a conference of historians of technology and science technology studies people, a bunch of nerds, and then something really surprising happened, which is that it went viral. We got picked up by The Atlantic, uh, Le Mans, Guardian, we started getting emails from all over the globe, um, we got asked by the New York Times to write an op-ed, there was a Freakonomics radio episode about it. We got a book deal to write this thing called The Innovation Delusion with Penguin Random House. And it just kept going and going. And it, um, So part of what I want to do today is just tell you the ideas that we've been playing with and also talk about the next stage, which is how to take ideas from being ideas that you write about in books to something that you use to actually try to shape things in the world. So we like to make a, a distinction between actual innovation, which is the process of introducing new things or processes in the world, and what we call innovation speak. Uh, here's a free uh, uh, text mining tool that all of you would probably know, called Google Ngram, which is not being maintained uh, and will soon be totally worthless, basically, because it ends in 2008. But what it shows you is that innovation, the notion, the, or the, or the word, uh, has been around for a long time, and that it, the uptick in it is really a post-World War II phenomenon. Um, and I can go into the long history of where this came from. It basically comes out of economics and uh, worries about economic growth and ideas that technology and new business processes generate economic growth. And then the, the question is, how do you generate more of that stuff? Now, going back to the distinction, there's a question, there, well, I'll get into this in a second. Uh, I think what happened is, uh, you know, what eventually happened is that the way of talking about, which often was in government and business, basically got connected to a kind of Silicon Valley approved lexicon of buzzwords, like disruption, you know, it used to be killer ass, well, luckily that got killed itself, uh, you know, big data, all these kind of buzzwords that fly around in circles focused on innovation. Now, a big question is, does innovation speak lead to actual innovation? 
You might think I'm joking here too, but I'm not. Uh, I think that, you know, according to some books like Robert Gordon's The Rise and Fall of American Growth, when we look at productivity and the relationship between technology and productivity, the productivity gains from technology where the boom was between like 1870 and 1970. And since that period, we have not seen rates of really high innovation, like uh, economic growth driven by innovation. So we've been saying the word more and more, but it doesn't turn into actual productivity growth, it turns, I think it looks like. Meanwhile, while it's unclear if talking this way actually gets us a thing, um, we've been making really deep changes to fundamental institutions in our um, society, especially higher education, which we turn, treat more and more like corporations with commercialization and patent offices and stuff. I'm writing a piece right now, Virginia Tech and Amazon have teamed up for this innovation campus in Northern Virginia. And I'm writing a piece for a publication on higher education that just says, there's no evidence these things actually produce innovation. I'm sure that'll be good for my tenure case. <laughs> uh, here's one other angle, this is crack cocaine. Uh, according to very strict economic definitions of innovation, Crack cocaine was very clearly a major innovation in the 1980s and 1990s. It started off cheap, lots of people wanted it, it disrupted other technologies like snortable cocaine. Um, there's a lot of risky entrepreneurship called drug dealing. I mean, it is innovation, pure and simple. This is obviously a massive innovator. And the point here is that when we when we talk about innovation, we treat we treat it like an implicit value. We're we're, we're pulling something there, right? Innovation is not a good in itself. We have to say, like, what is this new thing? What value is it? An end is it serving? So with the maintainers, we try to, uh, I'm gonna give you kind of four takeaways from the maintainers. There's lots of ideas associated with, with it, but this is four things. We try to recenter the conversation about human life with technology. So technology is not innovation. If I had more time with you, and in classrooms, I usually run students through a kind of guided meditation where I have them close their eyes and run through their morning. And then I say, all right, let's think about the technologies that you've encountered in your morning. You woke up in a bed, very old technology. Mattresses, old, right? You used a toilet, old, old technology, John Crapper, old. Um, you know, you use stairs. Those go back to like Mesopotamia. And then what, what you realize is that most of the tools that you encounter in your life are in fact very old. And when you're talking about, you know, technology, very often when my students say technology, they mean their cell phone. This is all they mean, okay? Not only is most technology old, but most human effort goes into maintaining and using those technologies to do stuff. Even in cutting edge fields like software, 60 to 80% of effort and budgets goes into maintenance. Less than 10% goes into design. So technology is not innovation. Infrastructure is crucial. That's why we're here today. We're talking about infrastructure. If you think about the experience of modernity, everything from clean drinking water, we hope that it doesn't have lead in it and such, right? Uh, to the lights in here, the internet we're using, all these things rely on massive infrastructures. And if you look at the, in, the, America, the American Society of Civil Engineers infrastructure report card, where we always get like D pluses or whatever in this country, we're not really good at ma uh, ma maintaining our infrastructure. We often fail to consider the maintenance costs of new systems. We don't think about maintainability. I've heard that throughout the whole day. I mean, David, I love your very pessimistic opening. I was like, I have found a new home, clearly. Um, uh, and, you know, but this isn't just in digital systems. This is throughout all of our society. You know, this is why we have trouble with roads. Um, and finally, it leads us to think about the maintainers, the people who keep all this stuff running, okay? And lit from Liz to the, the, the data and infrastructure uh, panel, we're really hearing that the, it's about the maintainers and how to maintain the maintainers and maintain their knowledge. 
Okay, so I think Andy, Andy and I would have been happy to just continue doing our academic conferences. We are trying to tack towards the practical world of things, but we weren't doing very well. Then something changed, and what changed is that this uh, woman named Jessica Meyerson, who was at uh, the UT libraries uh, and now works at Educopia, came into our lives. And she came to Maintainers 2, our second conference, and she just kind of buttonholed us and said, Can you, you want to start talking on Zoom like every two weeks? And we're like, okay. Um, and but she, like, really clearly we realized that she was teaching us what to do with our group and how to move it to the next stage. And she also taught us through consulting and leading us, really. Uh, she, she was able to frame up our project to kind of move it from ideas into community building in a way that the Sloan Foundation was able to get behind this last fall. And um, this is a badge I gave her just to say like, she was once a deputy but now she's a sheriff. And what the grant allows us to do is work with Educopia. <laughs> Catherine's not a guru, we decided we need to find another word for her. Uh, and this project manager, um, and what we're trying to do is build communities around these ideas. So that what we find is there's a bunch of different sectors that are working on in, uh, infrastructure and maintenance where they want to have conversations about these ideas. And then the goal is that we're finding commonalities that when people are find, experiencing in these different domains, and we're trying to aggregate those commonalities up to some kind of general lessons learned. The, the lessons are pretty general, actually. If you look at a bunch of different domains on, infra on infrastructure and maintenance, the same lessons apply in lots of different places. Um, oops. Uh-oh. I put slides in and then forgot. I, I didn't update. Uh, let me give you an example. I went to a maintenance conference called Mainstream uh, a year or two ago. All maintenance professionals from like utilities, heavy industry, these are people who do serious maintenance work. Okay, they're talking basically about adopting what are called computerized maintenance management systems, uh, which fail at a rate of like 70% of adoptions fail. All right, adopting software is hard everywhere, not just in libraries. And what they, what they, one of the lessons was they said the soft stuff is the hard stuff, which means all the human, it's a human element that you guys have been talking about here today is the actual difficult stuff. This is true everywhere when it comes to software. It's not just this domain. So uh, I just want to tell you briefly about two of the groups that we're working with through this uh, community building thing. Oh, these are the first four communities that we're starting to get off the ground. There's info maintainers, that's the group that focused on libraries and archives. Uh, software maintainers is more open source, purely, right now. Uh, transportation, and then I'll t briefly tell you about workforce. So the, in the, the info maintainers are a group of librarians and archivists who um, are writing a paper which is out on June 10th. Um, it's called Information Maintenance as a Practice of Care. And they're applying feminist care ethics to the uh, to, uh, ideas of uh, information maintenance in libraries. Um, and this is the list of all the people involved so far. Um, <clears throat> there's also a group called Maintainers in the Workforce. This uh, group looks at uh, workforce and labor issues more generally, labor law, wages, and such. And we're working with a woman named Stephanie Hoops at uh, United Way. She started a, a, a project called Alice. And what Alice does is it basically measures the working poor in the United States. Finds that like about 40% of families are teetering on the edge of financial insolvency and can't afford goods. So what we did with her is we took the Bureau of Labor Statistics occupations and divided them into maintainer and innovator roles. So you have inventors at the top, uh, adapters, and then the two uh, maintainers roles, nurturers and infrastructures. And we just, it was it's really a thought experiment. Like, most engineers are maintainers and operators, but we just pretend they're inventors for this. We're just like, we'll buy into your ideology for a second and pretend you're all inventors, that's cool. Um, but what it finds is that most people working are in fact doing maintenance broadly construed, and that most of the working poor in the United States are in this class of people who are just like keeping things going. 
this, there's a lot of upshots from this, but one of the things is that innovation policy, you cannot have enough innovation policy to solve the working poor problem, right? So you have to deal with that some other way. Um, we're holding the third maintainers conference this fall in Washington, D.C. There's an information maintenance track. I won't read all that text. Uh, the deadline for proposal submissions is May 13th. Rockefeller Center, Archive Center. Um, saw, I, I'm so bad at live tweeting, he didn't know where I was today when I was tweeting from here. He's like, I don't know where you are, dude, but can you tell those people to propose something for the conference? So I just put up this tweet. Please, if you're interested in these uh, topics, we're, uh, go to the, it's themaintainers.org, um, and we'd love to see uh, proposals for panels or papers or performance art, whatever you're into, there's ways to propose it to us. So we'd love to see whatever you've got. Thank you very much. Each of you have touched you know, multiple nerves that people will want to uh, follow up on. But the question I've got really comes back to the topic of this panel. Um, and what I'm wondering about is from each of your perspectives, what I'm hearing you describe are ultimately grant-funded projects right now that are, if nothing else, enabling you to dedicate your time as a PI um, to furthering this vision brought into the world. What are you thinking about the sustainability of your own effort? Um, how do you maintain yourself? And how you know, are you thinking about what your next step is going to be? actually don't have grants, but it's not as simple and rosy as it may appear. Uh, so we do have uh, about 300 professors who are involved in the project on a more or less regular basis and willing to help anytime. And then also at least a few hundred students. The problem is that many of the functions that need to be completed to maintain the project so need to be completed by people who have organization-specific knowledge. So while we have a lot of people who say, just tell me what to do, I'll help you two, three hours a week, most of the tasks require much more knowledge uh, than someone who just works two, three hours a week. And for that, we do need some sort of a grant so we can finally hire someone permanent, not a graduate student who will graduate two years, you know, once he finally starts getting what, what we're doing, he just graduates. So uh, that's a big challenge. And so far, it's been, you know, all those two years, it's been running on me working virtually nonstop and a few other professors who work, you know, basically for free extra time. In a sense, yes. Well, we do get some benefits, such as we get the data out of it, so it's almost like some people run research labs with monkeys or rats. We have this, so the time is sort of well spent. But yes, how sustainable it is, you know, if something were to happen to some of those people, I just hope there will be new people who will step in and will work for free. But yes, otherwise, it is a threat. Yeah, I think for us, the, the goal is you know, grant writing is one of the few things we can do in higher education that rewards collaborative work. Because so much of what we do, at least um, for those of us who are uh, tenure track, has 
to still flow within the silos, which has a lot of use. Uh, but the downside is that it becomes difficult to create artifacts for interdisciplinary work. So grant writing is a fantastic way to do that. But we've really used grant writing as a bridge to giving the project away. So for our current grant, we brought on uh, Arizona State University, uh, the computer science department here at UNCG, uh, obviously the libraries and Educopia, as we already mentioned. So we're, tr we're trying hard to, to find people better than us who want the CV lines, who want to get on board, and to essentially try to find a way to make it good enough that someone else wants to take it over. Um, beyond that, uh, the long-term sustainability, um, we're trying to find ways to um, really make connections. I'm trying not to use the word innovation here. That's what I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been looking for ways in which, you know, because not only does MassMind fill a gap um, for research, but it really fill, fills a gap that's there in industry too. So we've made connections recently um, with um, uh, in Washington with one of a, a conservation lobbyist group who we're starting to consult with, who doesn't want to pay the, uh, I think they were quoted 30,000 a year for social network data they need. So we're helping them potentially figure out a way to take MassMind, which is open source, and turn it into something that can then be used for research on their end to help support conservation efforts, uh, specifically around uh, uh, water and fishing and public use of fishing to combat uh, commercial, commercial fishing. So uh, th this is generally referred to as data for good, but looking for ways in which you can combine these efforts to fill gaps that are there in the data industry currently, but then also have that turn into you know, nonprofit support for MassMind to be sustainable. So I think for us long term, we're going to turn into a nonprofit organization, but we've got more work to do till then. So. Yeah, so I think that's like the question for us uh, and the road forward. There's a lot of models on the table from membership models to consulting models because there's organizations that would like to talk through these things to, you know, we have corporate sponsors now and might, might have more down the road. Um, but, uh, yeah, and yeah, so I think there's a lot of different ways, but we're not really clear yet. The only thing I would add is one of the reasons I think Sloan's interested in funding this and a lot of other foundations are interested in the work too is because foundations have been, granting agencies generally have been so innovation driven. And the, the foundation, I mean just think about the DH world, right? The, there's, so many, there's so many projects being made and then they're dead. And the, the, you know, the foundations are seeing this and they're realizing, well, we need to have a different way to think about these things to have some real long term you know, long-lived projects. So I don't think, you know, I think that, at least for the time being, foundations are the way forward for us. And questions from the audience? Yeah, I'll start. Um, I was just, Aaron, this is mostly for you. Um, coming from a publishing background, I hear your talk on algorithms, and my first thought is altmetrics. And I didn't know, you know, you're a published author, you've done editorial work. If we want to find new ways as Scott the Communicates community to evaluate work, and we have to work with these for-profits who are manipulating the data, I don't think is a uh, abuse of what your talk is about. How do we as researchers take the other side, but not just use these resources to find information for our research, but in order to you know, evaluate its impact or even distribute it? I just raised this in my classroom with my students because I talked about why I just left social networks. Um, so to talk about like the promotion aspect, um, you know, it's complicated. I, I struggled with this as, as an assistant professor on whether or not the ethical choice to, to specifically leave Facebook and Twitter um, would impact my career because a lot of the networking I did to build MassMinus originally to work with uh, other folks in the digital humanities was through networking I did Facebook. And so I, and a lot of the networking that still goes on, specifically in my field, is primarily in Facebook. Um, so one of, the, one of the things we have to remember, I think, is that 
these networks aren't the only natural place in which we can do this work. So there's a, as we see with sort of the history of the internet, we, we sort of scaffold and democratize each level to where everyone else can get involved in doing that, right? So for like gen one of the internet, it was everyone learning how to make their own website, right? Gen two is, you know, the, the web 2.0, I think, so the next level is going to be a fracturing and the creation of niche networks. I think we should be creating uh, our own social networks specifically for distributing and promoting an academic work. That way when we use that data then for alt metrics, and I think this connects to one of the earlier panels where, they, where he specifically mentioned data creation as a key aspect in making sure that the data we get is useful. I think we need to get involved in building our own networks and making our own networks. We, and, and I think we, we really need to start looking at the amount of money higher education sends to Microsoft, Google, et cetera. Like we're a Google campus here. Why aren't we developing our own email system that's not surveilled? If we look at the amount of money across institutions that's being sent to these companies, we could essentially have an open source uh, pool of money that we use to develop our own tools for our own services in academia. It would be a huge boon, a huge opportunity of development, and I think you know, the answer lies somewhere in there. So I don't know that I would trust Facebook or Twitter for any alt metrics, um, personally. And on both 
levels, I wouldn't want to over-rely on metrics, because I think we, if you, if you will agree, like Jerry Mueller's book, The Tyranny of Metrics, metrics create perverse incentives to like, you know, start teaching the test more or less. So I don't want to over-rely on them, but I actually don't think that measuring maintenance quality and, uh, you know, how people feel are mysteries, ultimately. Like, I think we have tools for doing both of those things. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, things from industry that we can use to show that things are being well maintained. And there's, you know, there's tools we have from human resources and other things to talk to maintainers, like, are you feeling well recognized by your organization and things. So for us, at least, like, the way forward is to introduce new metrics around these things to, to talk about how to shift organizational priorities. And I think that brings us to the end. So one more round of applause for